from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we sometimes veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Special thanks to some of my patrons, Rachel, Whitney, Pixie, Maya, Alethea, Elena, Aaron, Katoras, Catherine, Sam, Linda, Janice, Katarina, Teresa, Sarah, Sophie, Nanette, my two Emmas, Emily, Gabrielle, Galen, Cassandra, Bree, David, John, and Judy. Thank you so much. You guys are truly appreciated. And for anyone else, please feel free to join my patrons so that I can bring you more of what you crave. This week's podcast will be on Helena Blavatsky. Now, this one came so greatly requested and for so long, I knew I'd better not put it off any longer. I knew going in that this was going to be a huge endeavor. However, the sheer volume of information out there is overwhelming to say the least. I cannot express to you guys enough that I couldn't possibly fit everything she taught herself, researched, believed in, and taught others. After listening to her life story, if you are curious about anything I only touched on or want to know more, I highly encourage you to do your research. She is absolutely fascinating to me. And also, this goes without saying, I will not say some names correctly and I apologize. I never mean any disrespect. Helena Petrovna von Hahn was born on August 12, 1831 in Dnipro, Ukraine. So, as we always do, let's get into some history for that time. This is the year that Charles Darwin took his Bachelor's of Art exam at Christ's College, Cambridge, scoring 10th out of 171 candidates. Belgium adopted its own constitution after it gained its independence from the Netherlands, Leopold I was made king. The first practical U.S. coal-burning locomotive made the first trial run in Pennsylvania. Polish revolutionaries defeated Russians in the Battle of Grocho. John Frazee, which is a familiar name in our community, became the first U.S. sculptor to receive a federal commission. Our boy Edgar Allan Poe was removed from West Point Military Academy. The first U.S. bank robbery, the Citibank in New York, was robbed of $245,000. Soldiers marching on a bridge in Manchester, England, caused it to collapse. London Bridge was then opened to traffic. Admiral James C. Ross reached the magnetic North Pole. A hurricane hit the island of Barbados, killing about 1,500 people. Former slave Nat Turner leads an uprising against slavery. Scientist and inventor Michael Faraday demonstrated the first electric transformer. William IV was crowned King of Great Britain, then 64 years old, to assume the British throne. Ecuador and Venezuela separated from Greater Colombia. So you see, this was the atmosphere that Helena was born into. She was born into a military family in an area which is now Ukrainian, but was then part of the Russian Empire under the Romanov dynasty. On her mother's side, her grandmother was Princess Helena Pavlovna Dolgorukov, born in October 1789. Now, she was really something of a great intellect in her time and could speak five languages. She also painted was a botanist and a woman of science. In fact, she devoted an entire wing of her palace to an important collection of Caucasian flora labeled with Latin names and scientific descriptions. 
Her descendants all remarked on this fact, actually. A geologist and traveler who had visited the princess had this to say about her. Quote, In that barbarian land, I met an outstanding woman scientist who would have been famous in Europe, but who is completely underestimated due to her misfortune of being born on the shores of the Volga River, where there was none to recognize her scientific value. End quote. The princess's father, it is said, was greatly interested in mysticism and was a member of the right of strict observance in Russia. In other words, he was a Freemason who believed in obedience to, quote, unknown superiors or mysterious figures who were secretly directing the then current global events. Her maternal grandfather was Andrei Mihailovich de Fedieva, who was at one time a civil governor of the province of Saratov and later, for many years, the director of the Department of State Lands in the Caucasus and a member of the Council of the Viceroy of the Caucasus, Count Mihail Semyonovich Vorontsov. It all sounds very Star Wars, doesn't it? Of German origins, his writings have been extremely valuable work, giving the entire family background of the Defadievs and quite a lot of information concerning the various temporary stays of Helena as a child, as well as her parents. The work is also of great importance as a description of Russia life and of many historical personalities of the 19th century. According to Boris Dzerkov on Blavatsky's background in early life, Odessa, South Russian Society for Printing, 1897. In 1813, the princess and Andre were married, though her parents strongly opposed the marriage. He was not royalty, and they thought of him as a commoner, though he was a strong, honest, decent, and moral man. They had four children, but their oldest child, their daughter, Helena Andreevna, was born the next year. She is our Helena's mother. Helena, the mother, born in 1814, grew into quite the scholar herself. As you can imagine, she was nurtured in an atmosphere of culture and education. Sources state that she wrote 12 books, seven of which were published during her lifetime. Some include The Ideal, Utbala, Medallion, A Box at the Odessa Opera, The World's Judgment, and many more. So on her father's side, her grandfather was General Alexis Han von Rollenstern Han from Russian nobility. Her paternal grandmother was Countess Elizabeth Maximovna von Probsen. Now, her father, Alexis's son, was Peter Hahn, who was a member of the Russian army and was the captain of the horse artillery. Peter was 31 years old when he married 16-year-old Helena Fadiv. It was said that the marriage was not actually a happy one and they were not very compatible and in fact, she couldn't fit into the very suffocating role of a military wife. To put it bluntly, while she was a kind and considerate young woman, she had a very hard time, how does one say, identifying and relating to the ideas and sentiments of the more commonplace people. We'll say that. But she was actually the first woman in Russia to truly show, through her writing, the horrible things women dealt with, lack of opportunities and education, and yearned for women to have more. Our Helena was born prematurely, the first infant between the couple, again in August of 1831, in a now Ukrainian town, which was then part of the Russian Empire under the Romanov dynasty. This was, of course, the last imperial dynasty to rule Russia. And that's a whole other story in and of itself, and if you'd like for me to cover it, just let me know. 
But it was not a great time in Russia, as well as most of Europe, because there was widespread cholera that was killing a staggering amount of people. In the article, quote, Incidents in the Life of Madame Blavatsky, it was written, quote, The baby was born on the night, weak, and apparently no denizen of this world. A hurried baptism had to be resorted to, therefore, lest the child died with the burden of original sin on her soul, end quote. It was said that there were some bad omens around her birth as well. A priest was allegedly badly burned during her baptism, among others. And these are part of the superstitious beliefs of Orthodox Russia back then. So her childhood was an unusual one for her time, to say the least. She was immediately adored and fawned over by her grandparents and her extended family, some would even say she was extraordinarily spoiled. Her mother called her Lolo. It was said she had blonde, curly hair and alluring, beautiful, large eyes. From the beginning, she was brought up in the world of legends and superstitions, demonology, witchcraft, and the occult themes. Later, she stated that she had always believed wholeheartedly in the existence of an invisible world of spirits and beings whose lives blended with the lives of normal mortals. And interestingly, not only did Helena believe that she had psychic abilities, but apparently her family also believed. She later said she used to sleepwalk, which was apparently a sign of being possessed by the devil, and they would nearly bathe her in holy water and expose her to exorcisms from priests. Of course, there's no way of verifying those stories, but an aunt of hers noted that she was a very headstrong child of, quote, excitability of temperament ungovernable fits of passion and showed a deep-rooted disposition to rebel against every kind of authority or control. It is justly asserted by the memoranda before me. She has no malice in her nature, no lasting resentment even against those who have wronged her, and her true kindness of heart bears no permanent traces of momentary disturbances." End quote. But for the first 10 years of her life, she had to move fairly often due to her father's military career. But some of it was the fact that her mother seemed to be in poor health. Her mother had given birth to a baby boy a couple of years after Helena, but became sick and passed away. A couple of years after that, Helena's mother took her and moved in with Helena's grandmother, where her mother gave birth to a baby girl, Vera, born in 1835. After her sister was born, Helena's mother took the girls and went to be with her husband again, who was stationed in the Ukraine, and this was to be sort of a pattern in young Helena's life back and forth between her beloved grandparents' house and back to wherever her father was stationed. So in early 1838, her mother's health was in decline again, and they moved to Odessa for, quote, mineral water treatments. Then in 1840, her mother gave birth to another baby boy they named Leonid. Unfortunately, her mother died from tuberculosis in 1842 when Helena was just 11 years old. Her mother had only been 28 years old. Helena and her siblings were sent to live with the grandparents. When Helena was 13 years old, the story goes she was horseback riding when the horse got spooked and began to run. Her foot was stuck in the stirrup. She later stated that she felt someone's arms around her body, supporting her until the horse was stopped, as in some other energy, force, ghost, angel, whatever you personally believe in, was trying to save her. That same summer, her father came to see the children for about a month, but it had been around three years since they had even seen their father and didn't recognize him at first. That winter, Helena went with an uncle to the Ural Mountains and traveled through Siberia on the boundary of Mongolia. 
When she was back home with her grandparents, she apparently preferred to play with the servants' children rather than her appointed peers. She was a gifted and colorful storyteller at such a young age, and people seemed to really be drawn to her magnetic personality. So on and on she traveled with various family members all around Russia and beyond, including the northern Middle East. This nomadic lifestyle that she lived her entire life would greatly influence her life later on. She began having visions where she encountered a, quote, mysterious Indian man, which will come into play a little later in the story. And she also later stated that, in her later teens, she began having more paranormal experiences and began astral traveling, which is an out-of-the-body experience where your soul or whatever you believe to be your most inner essence leaves your physical body. Then during the winter of 1848-1849, the now 18-year-old Helena became engaged to Nikifor Blavatsky. He was believed to be about 43 years old at this time. Though the age difference is pretty astonishing, she agreed to marry him, mostly because she found out that he believed in magic and she was attracted to that. But then, not long before the wedding was to take place, that spring, it is said that Helena ran away. There is some speculation that that was due to a man known as Prince Gullitson, who was a student of the occult, but there really isn't much information on him. But alas, by June 1849, Helena was married to Nikifor. Immediately after, they left on a trip to Armenia. Now, she actually attempted on more than one occasion to escape the trip because she had not wanted to marry this man in the first place. Word around the campfire is that her governess had told her that she'd have quite the time finding a man who would want to marry her because of her temper and disposition. Even a middle-aged, unattractive man would refuse to marry her. She proved her governess wrong. But at what cost? And after three months of marriage, her husband finally agreed to let her go and she left him. It was said in all sources that this was a mutual agreement between them. She, along with her assistants, then rode on horseback to rejoin her relatives. Her relatives decided to send her back to live with her father, who was by now remarried in St. Petersburg. Helena had other plans, conveniently missed the boat, and boarded another that was headed to Kerch, which is on a peninsula between Russia and the Ukraine, and was going to go from there to Constantinople. And this would be the beginning of her many, many years of wandering all over the world, and thus it has made the job of historians who try to follow her path quite difficult to nail down her exact whereabouts during these years. What we do know is that during her 20s and 30s, she traveled all around Greece, various parts of Eastern Europe, Egypt, and Asia Minor, including the biggest part of Western Turkey. And since she did not keep a journal at this time, or no known journal has ever been found, and her own family was a little rusty as to her exact locations during this time, much of what she was doing during her travels are speculation at best. Helena would later say that she developed a friendship with a Hungarian opera singer after apparently saving him from being murdered. She said that she also befriended a countess who she accompanied while traveling. Helena also said that while in Cairo, she met an American art student named Albert Rawson and together, they visited a Coptic occultist, Paulos Metamon. And for those who don't know, Coptic is the latest written stage of the Egyptian language, much like how modern Italian is descended from Latin. Paulos was an Egyptian Christian. She got to walk right up to the very pyramids that we would all love to see for ourselves. You see, Helena was so deeply curious and interested in spirituality 
the meaning of our existence within the universe, that she devoted herself to the pursuit of knowledge and meeting people with whom she believed were experts in the field. We also know that young Helena traveled to Paris and London, where she met a friend of her family's, Princess Moransky, touring. But it was during this particular time period where Helena wrote about being alone in London for the earlier part of 1851, living in large hotel rooms. This is when she allegedly met an Indian man in person that had appeared to her in her childhood visions. He was a Hindu that she called Master Moria. She also met with a man named Victor Michael, who was a mesmerist or someone who believes in an invisible natural force that lives in all living things, including us, plants, and so on. It was stated that she was quite impressed with Victor. But out of her travels and meeting these exotic people, it was Master Moria's urging of her to travel to Tibet that stuck with her. He told her it was her special mission from him. So she decided to travel through the Americas up into Canada, where she later said she sought out the Native American tribes in Quebec because she wanted to meet with their magico-religious specialists. What she got was robbed by them, but she said it was the, quote, corrupting influence of Christian missionaries that had led them to doing it. She traveled south and visited New Orleans, Texas, Mexico, and the Andes, and finally boarded a ship headed to the West Indies, then on to Bombay. This is where she would spend the next two years of her life. While in India, the English authorities there were kind of suspicious of her and accused her of being a spy for the Russian government. Now, she claims that she worked as a concert musician for the Royal Philharmonic Society, though there is some doubt as to whether or not she actually did. But she did attempt to enter Tibet, but was unable to, being stopped by the British colonial administration. So, she headed back to Europe, apparently surviving a shipwreck before landing back in England. There, she later said she was met with terrible hostility simply because she was a Russian citizen. Not long after, she traveled back through Asia to try to visit Tibet. This time, she was allegedly successful in 1856, entering through Kashmir. One of the people traveling with her was a shaman trying to get through to Siberia. She was, at this time, only 25 years old. Can you imagine? In the book, quote, The Monist, Volume 14, Madame Blavatsky claimed that, quote, there exists in Tibet a brotherhood whose members have acquired a power over nature which enables them to perform wonders beyond the reach of ordinary man, end quote. She declared herself to be a disciple of these adepts and Mahatmas because they took a special interest in anyone studying occult lore. She swore these people were able to project their astral form out of their bodies, calling it their phantasmal appearance. It was now that she began to say that she was the, quote, messenger of the Mahatmas to the scoffing world, end quote. She studied and later exhibited an advanced knowledge of Buddhism consistent with anyone having studied in a Tibetan monastery. She was a witness to a Lamaic exorcism, which is an elemental demon believed in in Asia. She later wrote, quote, Then, with a convulsive jerk, the upper portion of the shaman's body seemed raised and his head fell heavily on the rider's feet which he clutched with both hands. The position was becoming less and less attractive, but curiosity proved a good ally to courage." End quote. She eventually left Tibet, traveling back into India. She said she had been directed by her occult guardian to leave the country, to which she did. But curiously, soon after her departure, there was some fighting breaking out in the country. She was back in Europe in 1858. 
She traveled through France and Germany and then finally returned to Russia, visiting her sister, whose husband had recently died. And then it was during this time that she began really pushing her psychological powers and became very well known throughout the area. It created quite the stir after a bit, so she traveled with her father and a half-sister to St. Petersburg. During this time, she got sick. It was described as a, quote, reopening of a wound near her heart received some years before, end quote. Now, the story goes that she had received a cut from a sword in magical practice in the East, and it had opened again, causing her intense agony, convulsions, and trance. But after Blavatsky recovered, her spontaneous physical phenomenon disappeared, and she claimed that they only occurred after that time in obedience to her will, according to biography. But whatever she was suffering from, she recovered and began traveling again, only this time allegedly disguised as a man, where she said she literally fought and was left for dead in the Battle of Mentana, which was a war that broke out between French papal troops and Italian forces. Now, most believe this to be hogwash, but she said it happened, so I included it in her story. It was around this time in 1860 that her beloved maternal grandmother, the princess, passed away. She went back to live with her grandfather for a year, and it was during this time that she traveled all around the Black Sea coast, where she studied magicians and became widely known for her newfound healing powers. And while she was staying in the Caucasus, she was riding a horse one day when she was thrown from the horse, suffering a fracture in her spine. She used the downtime to sort of hone her powers and be able to completely control them at will. So you get the gist. This woman was worldly, having traveled all over the globe, seeking out teachings from mystical or occultist theorists and practitioners, always wanting to learn as much as she could about different beliefs. I'm sure by this point you are thinking, you know, how on earth was she able to afford to live this nomadic life? Well, most of her money was supplemented by a very generous family members, but she was not above working in one area for a while to save up the money to begin traveling again. So after her travels, and especially after visiting Tibet, her mission was to prove to the world that spiritualist identified phenomena were objectively real. Her quest had been to discover who or what was God, Christian or otherwise. She wanted to know what was the spirit of man. She wanted to defend spiritualism against people who labeled anyone who practiced as a fraud. She really didn't believe that the spirits of the dead were contacting people, but rather they were either mischievous elements or the kind of shells left behind by the deceased. She met other mediums who she believed were frauds and even was able to close down a section of a spiritism society after only witnessing their performances for two weeks in Egypt. And then, according to Helena, one of the masters mysteriously told her to go to the United States. She arrived in New York City in July 1873. She was now 42 years old. She moved into a women's housing co-op in Manhattan's Lower East Side, and she worked by sewing, stitching, arranging fake flowers, and helping design advertising cards. She also supported herself by holding seances. And as I'm sure you have already guessed, it didn't take long at all for her to become noticed. Supposedly, she was able to actually produce manifestations during these seances, much to the shock and awe of the audience. How they actually happened? Well, I'll leave that up to your own beliefs. People in the U.S. at this time were quite open to the idea of psychic phenomena and spiritualism. And then she discovered a story in a newspaper written by a lawyer, Henry Alcott, who was very much a respected member of New York society. 
He had once worked for the New York Tribune, working as a special investigator, looking at corruption during the American Civil War. He was also, along with a few others, asked to evaluate the circumstances behind Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Henry had always been curious about spiritualists since he was a young boy. It was in investigating two brothers, William and Horatio Eddy, on a farm in Vermont, who said they were able to levitate and manifest spiritual phenomena that his and Helena's paths would cross. So she read Henry's story and set off to visit the brothers to see for herself whether or not the claims were true. The farm was a working farm and they had lodging there as well, so a person could come and get a room eat, and that night be entertained by the supernatural things the brothers could make happen, such as entities appearing, real, physical, observable happenings. It would just so happen that Henry had gone back to do some investigating at the same time Helena was there, and he wrote about seeing her for the first time. He said, quote, my eye was first attracted by a scarlet Garibaldian shirt she wore, as in vivid contrast to the dull colors around. Her hair was a thick blonde mop worn shorter than the shoulders, and it stood out from her head, silk and soft and crinkled to the root. I whispered to my companion, good gracious, look at that specimen, will you? End quote. She apparently stood, walked outside, and rolled herself a cigarette, and Henry followed her outside and offered her a light. After talking for a long while, and shortly thereafter, they struck up a very close friendship. It is not believed that they had any kind of love affair, more like brother and sister than anything else. Helena soon impressed Henry with her own abilities to manifest supernatural phenomena, and he wrote his own article about her. And make no mistake, even though she was worldly and obviously highly intelligent and curious by nature, she was driven more from the want of fame. The article garnered her much more attention, and the Daily Graphics editor published an interview with her and also talked about her in his book, quote, People from the Other World. She began teaching Henry her own occult beliefs and even talked him into practicing celibacy, as she did as well as becoming a vegetarian, though she didn't stay a vegetarian the rest of her life. They traveled locally together to research and witness others manifesting phenomena to discuss if it was real or fake. They began publishing a circular letter in a Boston-based spiritualist publication, The Spiritual Scientist. They referred to themselves as the, quote, Brotherhood of Luxor, and not long after, they began living together. And again, I want to stress, just as close friends and roommates. They decorated their apartment with taxidermied animals and pictures of spiritual healers and was quite bohemian for the times. They lived mostly off of Henry continuing to practice law. They then established the Miracle Club where they held lectures on esoteric themes and through these they met other notable spiritualists. Soon after, they decided to establish an esoteric organization of their own, and it was called the Theosophical Society. Helena herself stated that theosophy was not a religion in itself, but the name itself means God, divine wisdom. The society is still around today. So in 1875, the now 44-year-old woman began writing a book about her theosophical worldview, and she later titled it Isis Unveiled, and in it, she stated she was wholly aware of a second consciousness within her own body, calling it the lodger who is in me, and that it largely inspired her writings. She quoted, at length, from other esoteric and religious writings, her colleagues saying she was quoting from actual books she had absolutely no access to. But basically her idea was that all of the world's religions and beliefs came from a single, quote, 
ancient wisdom. She connected the ancient hermeticism, spiritualism, and criticized Darwinian evolution because it only dealt with the physical and didn't address the spiritual. Her book was a commercial success. New lodges of the Theosophical Society organization were established throughout the United States and in London. One famous member was none other than Thomas Edison. The society maintained links with an Indian Hindu reform movement. In July 1878, Helena was awarded U.S. citizenship and then she promptly moved to India. Henry, of course, joining her at a later date and got a job as a U.S. trade representative to India. When she landed, it was stated that she was greeted with celebrations from the locals. She secured housing in a Bombay native area and much preferred spending time with Indians rather than spending any time at all with the British upper crust, if you will. The locals were highly impressed with her and Henry because the duo were on their side about their local beliefs and thousands of years of localized religion not being converted over to Christianity. It was during this time that she and Henry worked on a monthly magazine they called The Theosophist, and it quickly became quite popular. This is when they changed the names from the Masters to the Mahatmas. The duo traveled all over India, speaking with spiritualists, Buddhists, who actually converted them over to Buddhism. A lot of mainstream people had heard of Helena at this point, and wherever she went, she was met with crowds of people who wanted to see her. And then she began saying that the Masters or the Mahatmas were telepathically commanding her to go to other places. She would hold seances where letters from the mystical Masters that no one had met or could see would just show up in physical form. And I really don't know how to describe it other than it seemed like someone unseen would throw a letter into the air and an unsuspecting person would feel it hit them in the head or fall at their feet from nowhere. The people surrounding Helena talked her up and said that the letters were in fact real and not fraudulent. And then what looked like a cabinet had been placed in the shrine room of the lodge that they were in and within that box letters from the masters would magically appear after a brief moment of time when someone would openly ask a question. This garnered questions very quickly and then two housemaids later confessed to a Christian magazine that they had helped Helena in this scheme to convince people that it was real. And this was the beginning of her downfall. The accusations garnered the attention of a very well-respected scientific group, the Society for Psychical Research out of England. They sent an investigator to India and for months the man spoke with everyone he could and did a detailed investigation about Helena and her claims. He concluded that there was no secret brotherhood of masters and that the letters were fake. The group said, quote, for our own part, we regard Blavatsky neither as the mouthpiece of hidden seers nor as a mere vulgar adventuress. We think that she has achieved a title to permanent remembrance as one of the most accomplished, ingenious, and interesting imposters in history. End quote. Now, this permanently injured Helena's reputation. People began backpedaling away from both her and Henry and both blamed the other for the drama unfolding. Henry told her that her overconfidence took things too far. She said that if Henry had not basically created a cult following of the supposed masters, this would never have happened. But in all, she was tremendously embarrassed, humiliated in front of her peers, which is unfortunate in my opinion. She was later quoted as saying, quote, when you speak of the imaginary Mahatmas, you are right, end quote. But Henry was so distraught that he admitted he contemplated ending his own life. He would admit that Helena exaggerated many things, but he could never come out and say that she was actually a fraud. In 1885, she left India for good. 
She was 54 years old at this point and settled down in London. She stated, quote, My heart is broken physically and morally. For the first, I do not care. Master shall take care. It does not burst so long as I am needed. In the second case, there is no help. I was ready to shed the last drop of life in me, give up every hope for the last shred of I shall not say happiness, but rest and comfort in this life of torture for the cause. I serve and for every true theosophist. End quote. She presided over a lodge in London, and she was still a big draw for anyone interested in her beliefs or just her as a person. By the next year, she was forced into using a wheelchair to get around, her health failing her. But people from all over Europe came to visit and speak with her to contemplate her ideas and teachings. She started a magazine, calling it Lucifer, where she focused on the discussion of philosophical ideas. She also finished writing her book, quote, The Secret Doctrine, end quote. And in the book, Blavatsky outlined her own cosmogonical ideas about how the universe, the planets, and the human species came to exist. She also discussed her views about the human being and their soul, thus dealing with issues surrounding an afterlife. Her writings garnished much respect, and she was much more careful about what she said or how she worded it. And then during the winter of 1892, England had been hit hard with an influenza epidemic, and unfortunately, Helena contracted the virus. According to a documentary that had been created about her and the Theosophical Society, she was sitting in her easy chair, many of her most cherished friends sitting around her, and they knew she was dying. And it was then when she passed away at the age of 59. Nearly all of the biggest, most well-known magazines and newspapers wrote of her death because she was a world celebrity. She was really kind of the first to be famous for being famous. Helena Blavatsky was the harbinger of the new age, fake or real. Her biographer, Peter Washington, described her as, quote, a short, stout, forceful woman with strong arms, several chins, unruly hair, a determined mouth, and large, liquid, slightly bulging eyes, talked incessantly in a guttural voice, sometimes wittily and sometimes crudely. She was indifferent to sex, yet frank and open about it. Fonder of animals than of people, welcoming, unpretentious, scandalous, capricious, and rather noisy. She was also humorous, vulgar, impulsive, and warm-hearted, and didn't give a hoot for anyone or anything. End quote. Side note, she sounds cool to me. Now, she has been described as one of the most influential occult thinkers of the 19th century. She left behind an image of a character, adventurous, author, mystic, guru, occultist, who helped create the Theosophical Society that still exists today. She influenced the lives of so many people, but I mentioned her in the podcast about the cult created by Anne Hamilton Byrne out of Australia, as she too was very interested in Helena. So whether in a positive or negative light, she was, and still is, an important figure. So tell me guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment if you're watching. All of my contact information is below. Again, consider becoming a patron if you'd like. And thank you so, so much for watching because I know you could be watching anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day.